you so much for joining. Uh, we're very glad to have you here. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, depending on which coast you're on. Um, this is our 2023 FinTech Predictions Tech Talk. Um, my name is Zach Perret. I'm co-founder and CEO of Plaid. Um, and I am really excited to be joined by a few of my colleagues this morning, um, Ginger, Alan, and John. Um, maybe I'll let you each give a quick introduction of who you are in that order. Sure. Hi, I'm Ginger Baker. I'm the head of financial access here at Plaid, and my team works on making sure that all people, regardless of their financial data type or provider, uh, can connect to the fintech experiences they want. Hey everyone, I'm Alan Meyer, and I'm the head of identity here at Plaid. Uh, I help make the products uh, that make verifying e uh, users easier for you, so that you can conduct business with them safely, easily, and securely. And I'm John Pitts, I'm the head of policy. I work on advocating for consumers' rights to access and share their financial data uh, to drive innovation, choice, and uh, better consumer outcomes in financial services. Uh, and we're gonna run this in a, there we go. We started the recording again, now we're ready to go. Um, so we're gonna share our FinTech predictions uh, this time in a, in a game show style format. For those of you that were with us last year, it'll be somewhat similar. Uh, so we'll share a prediction. Uh, we'll hear a thumbs up or a thumbs down um, from, from some of the team. We'll do a little bit of debate. Um, but before I get started, I wanna just share some really quick housekeeping. Um, so we wanna make this interactive. We wanna make it fun. Um, uh, and we'd love to hear questions from you. So there's a Q&A widget uh, embedded in Zoom. Uh, if you want to ask us a question, feel free to do so. We're going to grab all the questions and bundle them up and come back to them at the end. Um, uh, also, we're going to be recording the session uh, minus that brief 10-second uh, uh, period um, uh, when we didn't say anything at all of importance. Uh, but we're going to be recording today's session. We'll send it to you via email afterwards. So uh, if you want to share it with others, you are, you are more than welcome to do so. Um, and with that, uh, I would love to get started. So um, let's dive in. All right, so uh, the first, the first, first prediction. Um, this one is fairly straightforward, and uh, you know, I have a little bit of a soapbox that I stand on when I when I, when I like to say this one. Um, but uh, I think 2023 is going to be the year that open banking um, will finally become a reality in the United States. Um, uh, as all of you know, uh, open banking, the concept has been a reality in Europe for quite a long, long time, and we've seen it start to roll out around the world. Um, in the U.S., um, there is a piece of regulation. Uh, or a piece of rulemaking, I should say, um, uh, that is uh, that is expected to come through uh, throughout 2023. Um, this Dodd Frank Session 1033, um, and I expect that this, when this rule gets written, when the when the the structure finally gets put in place, we're going to see a uh, kind of a, 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 an enforcement of open banking standards within the United States, uh, which I am incredibly excited for. It. That said, it's going to take a lot of work to get there. Um, between uh, the regulators, the banks, the fintechs, there's a lot of consultation and conversation going on. Um, no, but I think this is the year of, uh, of, of open banking in the US. So uh, with that, anyone want to vote? Thoughts? Thumbs down, Ginger? Hmm. All right, Ginger, you're first. You have to, you have to answer. <laughs> okay. By the way, why does Alan have a different thumb type? Are we not? We have diversity of thumb types on this team, which I really like. Um, okay. So I am a no because I want to just be a little bit contrarian here um, for the purposes of debate. But I don't think open banking is going to become a reality in the U.S. this year because I, I actually think that open banking and open finance are already a reality in the U.S. And so even though the regulation may not be in place and may not uh, be solidified, I actually think that the market and the people have spoken and open banking and open finance are actually already here in the United States. Um, the U.S. has taken like a different approach to regulation um, in the U.S. than uh, our counterparts in Europe. And I think this is really healthy because they've allowed the market, people and businesses to evolve and to innovate, um, along with some guidance along the way. But they're using consumer demand to exemplify the kinds of things that fintech can do. And then they'll use the examples of that to help shape the policy. So I think this has been a really smart way that the U.S. has gone, but by no means is this just happening this year. Already 78% of U.S. customers say that their ability to connect a bank account to the apps and services they want to use is a top priority when they're choosing a bank. So our goal should be complete and portable financial data. The regulation will help, but consumers and companies have already locked and loaded open finance in the U.S. Okay, so agree, it sounds like in theory, um, but disagree on the technicality because you feel like we're already there. Um, I don't know who else wants to jump on this one. Maybe John. 
I mean, I would hope you would call on me, Zach, or else uh, we might be in a lot of trouble. Though, given the answer that Ginger just gave, I'm not actually sure that I'm required at Plaid anymore unless I'm able to pull out a real trump card, which fortunately I have. And I know everyone signed into this webinar hoping to hear a preview of Plaid's 115-page comment uh, to the CFPB Sabrifa on 1033. If you'll give me just a few minutes, I'm going to start and read through some of my favorite portions of it. Uh, no, just kidding. That would probably not be good uh, webinar entertainment. So let me let me talk about why I disagree with Ginger, because I do think this regulation is going to create a fundamental phase shift, because what the CFPB has proposed in their initial proposal here really comes down to two basic things that matter. One, the consumer does fundamentally have a right to access their financial data wherever it is. And two, it has to work basically 100% of the time. Now, in order to sort of convey the magnitude of how much I think this is gonna shift beyond what is already established, and Ginger, you are right, though I rolled my eyes a little bit about your trick answer to the trick question, um, the amount of change that's gonna happen, I think is profound this year. In 1919, a young army lieutenant named Dwight uh, took a road trip from Washington DC to San Francisco. It took him 62 days to drive that distance because the roads were absolutely horrible. In 1956, now President Dwight Eisenhower signed into law the uh, Interstate Highway Act. And so everything that all of us drive on today, the super fast 75 mile per hour highways, perfectly smooth, gets you from DC to San Francisco in two and a half, three days, like that's the, the step function improvement in quality we are talking about. So your best open banking experience today, which I know is on Plaid, is going to be your median open, data, open finance experience next year. And your best open finance experience next year is going to be your median open finance experience in 2025. Now, Zach, please have the engineers cash that check I just wrote. But I do think you like... It's a phase shift that you don't even realize what the impact is going to be, but it's going to be dirt roads to super highways. All right, you know someone's going to have a long answer when they start with in 1919. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I was I was wondering how long that one was going to go. Um, all right, John, uh, no pressure, but we now have to substantially uh, improve uh, improve the products overall. So. Uh, we, will, we will do some work. I love it. I think the directionality is clear. Open banking is here to stay. Uh, it's just a question of how good it can possibly get. All right. So um, that makes me really, really excited. Um, I'm going to shift to the next prediction. Um, uh, so the next one is around, uh, I don't know if we can click the slide in the background. Um, uh, the next one is around FedNow. So uh, the prediction is that FedNow um, launching uh, will lead to a kind of a, a cards versus bank payments debate in a large, larger way. And for those of you that uh, don't know what FedNow is, um, FedNow is a, a more rapid way of transferring funds between bank accounts. Um, uh, it is similar to um, RTP, uh, real-time payments, which is a standard that the clearinghouse launched. FedNow is being launched by the, 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 the sounds that you can probably tell, but by the Fed, uh, the Federal Reserve. Um, uh, and what, what we saw is that RTP got the ball rolling um, and created, frankly, a lot of excitement um, around this concept of uh, instant bank links payments or very rapid bank links payments. Um, you can think of this like instant ACH uh, as an oversimplification. Um, uh, but uh, you know, it didn't, it didn't quite reach full fruition. It didn't allow the debit side. It only allowed the credit side or the debit side has been really slow to roll out. Um, uh, and as we start to see competition from Fed now, um, I think it's going to accelerate. Um, I think that the entire market is going to accelerate. Um, I think it's also worth noting um, uh, kind of who will benefit from a switch to bank payments um, and who will suffer um, from kind of maybe reduced card volumes or reduced ACH volumes or kind of a reduction in other payments volumes as things move to instant bank payments. Um, but I do think when you look internationally, um, uh, you can see that kind of bank link payments have set a really exciting uh, and, and, and somewhat inspirational example um, that, that I'm hopeful that the U.S. Will, will, will be able to follow over time. So uh, FedNet launching will lead to uh, kind of a bigger cards versus bank payments debate in 2023. So I think the timing is important. I'm predicting that this year will be the year that, that we really see that. All right. Thumbs, thumbs, thumbs. Okay, Ginger, you have two thumbs. So I'm going to call on you again first. I, that's okay with you. <laughs> I know. I just, I just try to get called on. It's like sitting in the front of the class with my, with my hand raised. Um, so I do think this is going to really accelerate the debate. I do want to note, like, I think this debate is not totally brand new, but the 
context and the structure of the debate is going to fundamentally change this year. So I, that's why I agree with that. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of excited about it, actually. I mean, about a decade ago, when peer-to-peer -peer services started to launch like Venmo and Square Cash, you know, there was a debate at that time about our card link, uh, our card rails or bank link, bank rails better for these kinds of experiences. And um, the apps that we're developing at the time were really committed to this faster and you know real-time availability of funds. And at that time, the card networks just just developed it faster, right? They um, they built real-time settlement into their you know Visa. Um, direct and MasterCard send those those transaction types that they had. They got adoption globally for these types of transactions. They made the experience better. So it hasn't been much of a debate over the course of the last couple of years because the delta between the experience the card networks were providing versus bank link payments was just so massive, especially in the United States, that it wasn't an interesting debate. But I do think now that um, you know the clearinghouse and the Fed are going to have new developments, the experience delta is shrinking. And the battle becomes more interesting because now it moves towards this competition around market influence and business model and how these things are going to evolve. I do want to say just one thing, though, Zach, and what you said um, about like the shifting between the opportunities. I, I just think the pie is not digitized yet, right? There's still a massive amount of cash and check based payments, especially in the US, which is kind of embarrassing. But even in like the first year of COVID, when everything went digital, still 19% of transactions were in cash. Obviously not as much of that was like the volume of it wasn't as high as 19%, but the actual number of transactions was 19% cash. And even last year or in 2021, I think it was like 3.6 billion checks were collected by the Fed. I mean, that's just crazy. So I don't think it's um, like a winner take all between bank and card. I think it is um, digital should beat cash or at least paper. <laughs> Sure. Okay. It you seems like you want to talk, John. In 1919. No, in 1635, actually, the Holy Roman Empire bred a new breed of pony that was able to train. No, sorry. Um, so I think that answer, Ginger, is directionally right, but overlooks how significant some of the challenges are, is, are that are still left in the market. And I think the number one challenge is actually consumer expectation and consumer behavior, right? We've seen over the summer that in some real-time or real-time-ish experiences like Zelle, consumers expect a level of protections that they you know, see in the card payment systems or see in ACH where you've got delays and the opportunity to reverse transactions. And they don't yet understand that those protections don't exist in some of the real-time rails, right? Where the payment is instant and irreversible. And I think there's going to be a significant learning curve for consumers and merchants and banks and regulators to figure out how to layer in the right set of expectations and get consumers comfortable uh, with those frameworks. A, a sideline, it might help if you had a really good identity layer attached to those faster payments in order to squeeze fraud out of the system. Alan, I'm not actually just like tossing that one as a softball to you, but if you want to take it, you should. Um, the other thing that I think is going to be, you know, harder than people are expecting is the shifting in economic models that are going to be necessary for particularly the banks that play in this space. Because the reality is we have all been living in an interchange world for 50 years at this point, 50 years plus. And this is not an interchange world. And so there's going to be a little bit of an innovator's dilemma of do you capture the revenue that is the big digital pie of payments right now uh, that you have in your hand, or do you pursue the two revenue birds in the bush uh, that are coming down the road? And I think actually what you're likely to see is some people make that choice now and are successful. Some don't make that choice and have to preserve legacy revenue as long as possible. And I think you're going to see some new players enter the space to capture some of the opportunities that RTP and Fed now present to create new revenue streams for banks that have not been big beneficiaries of the interchange system. So I, I think it's actually going to be harder than the path you just laid out, Ginger. Once we hit that sort of understanding and adoption, I think it's a rocket ship to the moon. But I do think you shouldn't underestimate just how much consumer work needs to get done to make consumers comfortable with this system to the degree they're already comfortable with existing payment rails. Yeah, I I, I agree with a lot of what, what the two of you said. I'm actually a little bit more in Ginger's camp where um, uh, I tend to expect that uh, a lot of the, the real-time bank links payments 
uh, we'll transition more dollars from checks uh, to some extent wire transfers as well um, in cash than it will necessarily from from the card side. Um, but John, just on economics, one of the, the fascinating things for me is thinking about ways that banks can actually make new revenue from banking payments. So. Um, it's worth noting that ACH, um, uh, when uh, you are the one that is uh, kind of being asked to send money out of your consumer account, uh, you don't actually make any money with standard ACH, and you do make some money uh, with FedNow and RTP, so that's exciting. And I can imagine a world in which um, giving a consumer a loan, uh, a short-term loan, um, for the direct bank link payment that they are making is something that a bank would be really excellent at. So it could provide new revenue streams as well. So um, regardless uh, of, of exact timing and you know a lot of lot of work to be done, I think it's going to be a big year for for, for Fed now, and, and and I do suspect that Fed now is going to accelerate um, uh, kind of broadly uh, bank link payments. Um, all right, I'm going to jump us to the next one, um, and I want to actually come back a little bit to to, to talk about some of um, some of what John was, was teeing up Alan for there, um, but anti-fraud consolidation. So um, this one is uh, fairly straightforward, but um, one trend that we've seen over the past many years is that um, kind of fintech uh, and particularly digital payments, um, as those industries grow a lot, um, so too does fraud. Uh, fraud kind of follows, uh, uh, kind of uh, fraudsters will follow, follow this and attempt to, to kind of create issues there. Um, that said, um, we've seen a huge expansion of many, many kind of anti-fraud vectors um, and many, many anti-fraud vendors as well to solve for each of those vectors. Um, what we're starting to see is as the, the, the ecosystem matures, um, uh, many of the larger players in kind of anti-fraud, uh, many of those building uh, great fraud protection products um, are starting to now get through all of those vectors. And um, uh, I predict that this year we're going to start to see a consolidation um, of all of the anti-fraud companies. Um, we're going to see it kind of consolidate on those providers that have either big network effects um, because they've seen a lot, a lot of users and a lot of scale. And so they can see fraud more broadly um, uh, than maybe a small player could or those who have proprietary data. So they get data um, that allows them to build differentiated models. Uh, but I expect that we're going to see kind of the, the, the bigger players get bigger um, uh, and fewer of the really small uh, kind of fraud, fraud vendors um, continue to, to grow at the pace that they have in the past. Um, so I don't know, predictions, thoughts, thumbs ups, thumbs down, two thumbs up, Alan. Okay. Okay. There we go. Um, John, you're just being the antagonist here, but, uh, let's go to Alan. Let's, let, let's hear what you think. You know, this space better than I do. So I, I feel like I've been a doomsday sayer for a long time in the anti-fraud and verification space. Cause I've been saying this for way longer than it was actually true, but I think it's actually really true. Now, uh, if you've been following the anti-fraud or verification space at all, uh, Last year and the year before that was like a Cambrian explosion of all of the available new ways of uh, doing anti-fraud decisioning. There were things like behavioral analytics coming out, uh, ACH risk analysis, uh, mobile network operator authentication. But at the end of the day, there is a very finite number of publicly available data points that you can actually decision on. So that means that necessarily there needs to be some kind of consolidation. Uh, these niche checks don't have enough enterprise value by themselves. Uh, they're typically consumed as part of a broader anti-fraud portfolio or vision. Um, you know, just from talking to customers, we're seeing people choosing between literally 150 different vendors, uh, right? But at the end of the day, most of these customers are all converging on the exact same six to 10 or so vendors, uh, which means that you just don't really need uh, 150 different choices to, to choose from. Uh, I don't know if you went to any fintech conferences last year or maybe even the year before that, but you noticed something new, uh, which was that instead of it being regular fintech companies, every single booth was an ID verification or anti-fraud booth. Uh, and that was just one of the common jokes that people were saying on the show floors, uh, remarking on how many verification providers there were. It was truly nuts. Um, and I, I think a final point I'd want to add to this is that because of that proliferation of uh, anti-fraud solutions, there's also been a rise in platforms and hype uh, for helping you deal with those 150 vendors. That's typically referred to as an orchestration platform for identity. Uh, and I think it'll be really interesting to see, uh, you know, how their importance evolves over the next couple of years as these verification providers start to, uh, you know, consolidate into fewer and fewer vendors. Uh, but we'll see. 
Okay, great. Um, John, John, do you want to? I'm going to start with some year this. in the past. So let's see where he goes in history this time. No, I, I'm I'm going to teleport us to the future here, Ginger. I've already right. done enough right. backward looking because, um, for the first time in my four and a half years at Plaid, someone at Plaid has been more negative on the power of innovation than I have, uh, and that was Alan just now because. Uh, I agree with some of what you said, Alan, and because you also know this space much better than I do, let me pose this to you as a question and you can rebut it and tell me why I'm wrong. Because at the end of the day, identity verification uh, is a tool that responds to a government mandate. And the government mandate is relatively straightforward, right? So straightforward that we can do it in three words, know your customer or three letters, KYC, right? That's very basic, very easy. Everyone has to do it. It hasn't changed. But what has changed is on top of your Cambrian explosion was a pre-Cambrian explosion, right? Of all of the different types of financial services that look different from what we've seen in the past, whether it is crypto or new lending tools or income share agreements. Like we were really talking about massive new ways of doing financial services with an incredible amount of complexity. And that complexity is getting layered on top, stack, stack, stack of fairly static, fairly straightforward KYC requirements that have not fundamentally changed in a lot of ways. And when I see complexity layering on top of simplicity, what that tells me is that there is huge space for continued innovation to figure out how to navigate companies through the complexity of what they are doing into the simplicity of their government mandate, right? So that they can all meet it. And as more and more companies that have started sort of outside the regulatory perimeter move into it, which is I think a secular trend we're gonna see over the next couple of years, that KYC requirement is gonna start applying to more and more companies who are doing things that don't look like historic financial services, and they're gonna need help figuring out how to do that KYC. To me, that innovation imperative suggests that there is going to be a huge amount of room for not just 150, but 200, 250, 300 companies to come in, uh, find their niche to do one innovation for one sub-segment and figure out how to make identity and KYC work for them. So I still see a pretty powerful engine of innovation that's not going to allow that level of consolidation that you talk about because you're going to still want players out there on the frontier figuring it out. And that's not going to be sort of the six core providers. It's going to be the upstart. So I still see real pressure for more innovation, but maybe you can tell me why my pro-innovation tech first view is wrong for the first time ever. So sorry to disappoint you. I don't think you're wrong. I just think that we can both be right at the same time, uh, which is unbelievable. Uh, so I, I think what, you know, what really impacted the last couple of years was the zero interest rate environment, right? So what I'm saying is that it was an artificial inflation in the actual supply of ID verification uh, and uh, anti-fraud companies relative to the actual demand from the companies that existed there. Uh, and I know you were making fun of me earlier uh, for saying uh, a bunch of Gen Z and late millennial words. So I'm going to give you a new one, which I don't know if you've heard before, uh, a ZERP. So not a zero interest rate policy, but a zero interest rate phenomenon. Uh, this is a, a common internet term now. Uh, it's almost always used satirically to indicate something uh, in business, uh, cultural, or, or just general society that only exists in a world with zero interest rates. So I would actually argue that uh, you know the number of verification providers is a ZERP, right? There wouldn't have been this many if there weren't this influx of uh, incredible amounts of VC capital, and uh, it won't be able to be sustained in the coming years. Well, thank you for that reminder that I need to subscribe to Kyla Scanlon's TikTok to keep up with all of the millennial financial macro uh, terms, but you learn something every day. How do you think I keep my business edge? <laughs> so I think uh, I think the, 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 the one thing that brings us a little bit back together, John, I think, um, you know, really noticing the difference between compliance tools and risk and fraud tools. Um, in compliance, it is generally... Uh, uh, written on paper what a team has to do. So uh, know your customer, there's a checklist, there's a set of actions that you have to take. Um, in risk and fraud, it is much more of an optimization problem. Um, so the question is, can I maximize the number of good users that come in and minimize the number of bad users that come in? And I think 
Um, when, when, when we focus on compliance, um, of course, you know, it's a fairly straightforward path to execute. When we focus on risk and fraud, which um, identity verification products ideally should do both, um, it's an incredibly complex um, path, path to go down. And uh, so um, uh, lots more to come from this market. And uh, I'm sure we will hear more from, from Alan and, and, and John as well on this. I'm going to shift us uh, to our next one. And by the way, I've been really impressed at a lot of the questions that have been coming in. And we'll touch on some of them as we're talking and hopefully we'll have some good time for Q&A at the end. So please feel free to keep, uh, keep, keep putting them in here. All right, um, next one, I'm gonna talk about crypto. Uh, I'm gonna do two crypto predictions, bundle them together. Um, uh, and then uh, we, can, we, can, we can hand it off to the, to the panel to, to, to hear what they think. Um, the first one is um, a little bit of a joke, but also fairly true. Um, big company crypto roadmaps are finally shipping, yay. Um, many big companies uh, started building crypto products in kind of late 2021. Um, and thanks to very, oftentimes very, very, very uh, long innovation cycles, we're just now seeing many of these go live. Um, crypto winter be darn. Um, they're going to launch these products and they're going to be out there. And my hunch is that these products are not going to get a ton of traction and they're probably not going to get a ton of usage and some of them might die on the vine just because they took so long to get out there. And, uh, might be wrong on that one, but I, 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 I think that, uh, you know, a lot of the effort that's been putting in from, from a lot of big companies is going to go a little slower. Um, the second side of that and, and frankly, uh, related one is, uh, crypto winter continues. Um, the prediction is not that the winter will continue. That one is fairly straightforward. Um, the, but, but the prediction is that we're going to continue, going to see a continued stream of downward pressure on the crypto market. Um, we're going to see, frankly, a bunch more winding downs, uh, throughout the first half of 2023. Um, and the prediction here is I actually think we might see some of the larger names, uh, probably not the largest names, but some of the larger names um, actually being impacted by some of the heightened regulatory scrutiny. Um, I know that there, there, there's a lot of talk um, in DC about um, not only enforcing regulations even more, uh, but potentially even a crypto law that might come out or a crypto related uh, law or rule um, that might come out. Um, uh, second is just ongoing contagion from the firm failures in the past. Um, and then finally, um, we're just continuing to see low usage um, amongst consumers. And so um, winter will continue, but like I think that the pace of firm failures might, might, might continue as well um, over the next 12 months. So um, I, I, it's hard to, hard to choose one or the other uh, that you can respond to, but I'd love to see thumbs, thumbs agreements, disagreements. Okay, um, Alan, I think um, because you've educated us on, uh, on, on, on so many things about Gen Z already so far, um, and Gen Z has something to do with crypto, um, uh, why don't you take this one first and then we can hand it off to Ginger. All right, great. I love that this is my brand now. Uh, that's, a, that's a good brand to have. All right, Gen Z uh, whisperer. So, yes, exactly. Uh, as not even a Gen Z. So it's a, for me, it's a big disagree. Uh, so I actually think, uh, and you know, this is coming from someone who is a really big cryptocurrency proponent, right? Um, but unfortunately, I've been in this uh, space since 2013, and I've seen many big companies only care about crypto during the boom cycles. Uh, and then I think that actually many projects are going to be canceled this year, like we saw with IBM's shipping container project, uh, I forgot what it's called, I think Trade Lens or something like that. Uh, and the Australian stock exchange project uh, where they were trying to rebuild their exchange underpinned by blockchain tech, that was also recently canceled. Um, so I think we're going to see that uh, again and again, because what I've seen is that anytime, uh, you know, the budgets are approved during the boom cycles, when there is any kind of issue whatsoever in the future during the bus cycle, like, you know, maybe they have a cost overrun or, uh, you know, scope creep in those underlying projects, there are some of the first to actually uh, end up being canceled. Um, on the crypto winter side, I mostly agree, but I would add a little bit of a caveat here, which is that I think it's going to be a very sleepy year for outsiders. So I think outsiders aren't going to hear too much from the crypto space. But for the people who are in the crypto space, there's going to be a lot of exciting things that come out, uh, new protocols, new inventions, uh, that all of the people who have been in crypto for a while are going to get super pumped about. And then that's going to be the catalyst for the next cycle. You know, We've seen that time and time again. Uh, that being said, there will be some latent big ripples through the year because of the FTX fallout um, and more inside baseball, the, the Luna collapse. Uh, that's just going to take many, many months to proliferate through all of the different businesses. Um, and yeah, we'll see how it shakes out. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hop in here with a, with a green thumb. Um, so I do, I do think that the roadmaps are finally shipping and I don't think they're going to stop, but I think that the roadmaps may alter in terms of speed. And maybe Alan, this is sort of what, what you were also saying, but I think as we've seen with any sort of 
industry wave of change, whether or not that's proliferation of mobile devices, the like uh, rise of mobile wallets, use of social networking and social graphs for financial services, any of these like net new technical waves or social waves that drive change in the industry. I think historically we've seen the, you know, the roadmap of the bigger players sort of sit on the sidelines and watch where the smaller players and net new companies were innovating and testing and learning and moving forward on their roadmaps much more quickly. And then you would see the larger, more entrenched players adopt those learnings, um, you know, take the elements that worked, remove the ones that didn't, and sort of recast it into a more stable offering over the long term. So I think more entrenched companies are definitely playing the longer game um, in this area. And so we should expect them to per perhaps slow, but I think the roadmaps will actually just get a lot smarter. Um, on like the crypto winter, again, I just like reframing slightly. I do think the flashier projects are going to go away and folks are going to focus on utility. Um, the United Nations is now sending uh, USDC via the seller network to displaced Ukrainians so they can convert it into local currencies. Like these are real world societal problems where crypto and crypto companies can play a meaningful role in helping to solve them. But they're going to be focused on, you know, real problems that affect real people and, and drive real value. And so I think that's the that's the shift. And I actually don't think that's a bad one. Um, so, yeah, maybe the crypto winner is here, but I, I welcome it in some ways. John, do you have any thoughts on crypto? The only thought I have here is that Alan and Ginger have left out the most enterprise of enterprise companies, which is the federal government, right? And we have seen continued movement on uh, central bank digital currency. I think we're gonna we're not gonna see it this year, but we're gonna see continued movement there. And I do think in terms of really unlocking a next wave of innovation, when you have something that it, is backed by the federal government as this is an appropriate application of crypto that can cross the barrier between banking and crypto as well. I think you're going to see a lot of opportunity to continue uh, innovating there. So uh, just a, a plus one to the big company crypto roadmaps, that big old federal government is coming. All right. So Alan, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask an off, off, uh, off script question here, but um, uh, you, you had a great uh, statement, and I think you might have tweeted about it too, that um, you said kind of in 2013, 2014, we had the ETH crowd sale, which led to ICO mania. In 2017, 2018, we had uh, CryptoKitties, which again, these are things that happened during the, the downtimes, um, which then led to in 2021, uh, NFT mania. Um, in 2021, 2022, uh, at the beginning of crypto winter, we saw um, kind of a, a decentralized social media being the hot thing. What is, what is it in the next uh, crypto up cycle? What does that lead to? Uh, it's going to be really hard to tell because it's always a slightly different version of what you actually see in that late cycle trend. But I think it's going to be more intelligent ways of um, uh, stepping back for a sec. I don't know if you guys have heard of Mastodon, but basically there was this big social network called Mastodon that cropped up as a potential alternative to Twitter after all of the Elon Musk uh, occurrences uh, that happens. And uh, the entire premise behind Mastodon is that you don't have one central server uh, that's actually able to control all the data and moderate it. People can create their own instantiations of that same server, and then um, uh, you can choose which uh, moderator you like the most. So if you don't like this person's algorithm, you can go with that person's algorithm. If you don't like how they moderate something, you can go with how they do it. Um, and it's a step forward, uh, for sure, relative to the very centralized model that Twitter has. But I think that a proper fully decentralized version of even that, that Mastodon model, uh, is probably the next potential step there. Uh, I even think that Twitter could be the ones who uh, pioneer that. And I, you know, Elon Musk is no, uh, he's no stranger to the crypto hype cycles. So I wouldn't be surprised if he is the catalyst for the very next, uh, you know, hype cycle. There we go. There we go. Now we've got your predictions on record. Um, this is great. All right, I'm going to move us off crypto. Um, move us back to uh, kind of more, uh, more, more, more standard uh, financial services. Um, so the the next one from my side is um, B2B fintech companies are going to really ramp up their efforts to sell to banks this year. So one of the things that we've seen over the past 12 months is uh, you know the rate of new fintech company formation has slowed down. 
um, the rate of funding going into uh, really small fintech companies has slowed down. And frankly, the rate of spend of those small companies in order to maximize growth has slowed down a little bit as well. Now, all of this is offset by other things, and we'll talk about that in the next prediction. Um, but what we've started to see is that um, B2B fintech companies are shifting who they're selling to. If, if the early stage market is not as, as poignant, um, uh, the banks themselves are, are actually uh, you know, really great buyers. And um, so um, my, my prediction is that we're going to see um, a, an increasing focus on selling into the banks, um, and that will lead to uh, kind of a pretty rapid acceleration of digital product launches through the end of 23 and into 2024. Um, uh, uh, and I think that that will um, be a really exciting thing for the way that B2B fintech companies sell, but it'll represent a pretty substantial shift as well um, in the types of buyers that they're going after and the way that they can kind of uh, they have to structure their messages and so forth. Um, so thoughts on this prediction, shift uh, more towards bank sales. I've gotten uniformity. This is perfect. Everybody agrees with me. It's amazing. Um, all right. Um, let's see who's next. Uh, Alan, maybe do you want to take this one first and then uh, we can hand off? Sure. Yeah. I, I'll keep it relatively short and sweet here. Uh, so I'm a, I agree with this for sure. There are two trends that I've seen uh, specifically on the banking side. One is that uh, because onboarding tech is becoming very, very battle tested on the fintech side, banks are now becoming increasingly comfortable with purchasing uh, those uh, uh, anti-fraud and verification onboarding systems. Uh, in, so in some cases, I'm actually seeing banks be more aggressive than fintechs uh, with techniques like pre-populating customer PII from mobile network operator data, uh, which is something that some fintechs actually reject because they think it's too uh, lenient of an interpretation of the rules and regulations. Uh, so I think that's pretty interesting. And then uh, the second point is that, you know, talking to banks, I'm actually seeing uh, a lot of appetite from them specifically to consume fintech sourced anti-fraud data to bring into their onboarding decisioning. So they don't want this world where it's just uh, fintechs consuming from banks, but they actually want the fintechs to give back uh, and be able to help them with their onboarding. Uh, and I think that that's, uh, uh, you know, going to ramp up those buying cycles for the banks. Yeah, I, I really agree with this one. Um, and also just speaking personally on the kinds of things that we've been investing in at Plaid, to, to sell better to banks um, has been a really meaningful investment for, for our teams over the course of the last year. Um, and even now, uh, if you think about the way that sort of Plaid's network has evolved, it was primarily you know, fin fintechs um, are the institutions to whom data was being permissioned. Um, but now we're increasingly seeing the convergence of those two sides of the network where banks are now also the consumers of, of data that's being permissioned. And, just this year, actually, we passed a threshold where I think about 50% of the data that's um, coming into Plaid is actually coming from our existing customers. So if you think about, is it higher than that, Zach? Okay, more than that is coming from um, institutions who are also customers of Plaid. And we do this because we want to have a really robust network where any node on the network is getting a ton of value from working with Plaid. But we're also doing it because people are asking for it, right? So the banks are saying, no, I want to be able to have access to Robinhood balances, crypto exchange balances, and other kinds of things so I can be a better wealth advisor to my, to my customers, right? So this isn't something we just came up with on the side. It's because banks were saying, nope, we're ready to jump in here and, and we want to be consuming the same kind of information that fintechs have been doing historically. So I think this is super exciting. Also, banks are not going to run out of money <laughs> this year. So um, that's also a great reason to sell to them. Um, I love it. Fintechs, uh, uh, banks becoming fintechs um, uh, uh, and uh, kind of using, uh, kind of building their own fintechs products as well as um, kind of uh, be, be, being the consumer's uh, uh, financial home. So that's uh, a really exciting one. Um, all right, next one. Um, so uh, it, well, by the way, I'm, I'm super excited to jump into Q&A in a second. So feel free to drop your questions in. This is the last prediction that we're going to talk about from my side. And, and then we'll do, the best, do our best to answer all of your questions that are out there. Um, so the next prediction is every company is a fintech company. Well, that one um, uh, is a thing that I say a lot. Uh, it's a thing that I've talked about a lot before. Um, and to be a little bit more precise, um, most companies, um, we believe, will become fintech companies in some way, shape, or form. Um, but more specifically within that, I think the prediction here is that um, the slowdown in new fintech formation um, will be more than made up for by the continued push from a lot of uh, kind of things that you would think about, uh, the things that you might historically not have called fintech uh, to actually launch fintech products. 
Um, so for example, uh, we see people like retailers uh, or companies like retailers launching fintech products. Um, we see the bank themselves launching a lot of fintech products, uh, e-commerce providers, um, and many, many others. Um, and we're seeing them launch everything from wallets to lending products, um, so on and so forth uh, on down the line. Um, but I think that this year, you know, by volume, we're going to see uh, kind of the number of, of, of fintech products that are launched by kind of non-startups um, uh, potentially even eclipse uh, the number of fintech products that are launched by startups themselves. All right, votes on this one. John, no. Alan, yes. Okay. John, I'm going to go to you first because you're the outlier. Yeah, and unfortunately, as much as I'd like to disagree with you for like a fifth time on this, because I'm awesome at getting promoted, that was a lie. I'm a yes on this one. Um, so let me just give like a, a microcosm example of why I think this is absolutely true. We've seen in the last two years, the massive growth of, growth of buy now, pay later, and fundamentally the value for enterprise companies in embedding financial services at the sort of interaction layer with their customers. And whatever you think about sort of buy now, pay later as a product or the future of it or where it's gonna go from here, I think it has absolutely been the proof of concept that every company that engages in customers and their money, which is every company, is gonna to wanna to have better experiences and a tighter link between that money and the service they offer them. And so I expect, a rapid and continued growth in that trend. I actually think to go back to an earlier question, the rise in Fed now is going to be a big driver in that deeper embedding. Uh, so I'm I'm uh, a big thumbs up on this one. I think it is going to be a massive shift in the industry over the next couple of years. Amazing. Anyone else want to respond to that one? Great. We're all in agreement and we can shift straight to Q&A. All right, with that, um, thank you all for listening to our predictions. Um, now we would love to hear your questions uh, uh, related to, uh, to, to these predictions. Um, so there is a Q&A button at the bottom uh, as our wonderful slide shows here. You can click on the Q&A button, you can type in a question. Um, and I think that Alan is going to be the one to, uh, to moderate this. So he will, uh, he will direct it to us so that I can answer a few of them as well, hopefully. Yes, sounds good. Uh, all right, let me take a look at the questions here. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of questions on open banking, uh, which means, John, I'm going to give you this one. So just to get us started, uh, how do you and Plaid define open banking? Not sure why this is a question from me, but I'll try. Um, so I'm glad you asked. Let me turn to the right page here. And no. Um, so uh, it's a very simple concept. And I actually personally prefer open finance to open banking because I think there's a little bit of a sense that open banking is a government mandate uh, from top down. And open finance really reflects the bottoms up consumer driven movement that we've seen in the United States. And what open finance is, is the very simple proposition that consumers have the right to their financial data wherever it sits should have the ability to share that financial data with whomever they want in order to get a product or service that improves their lives. That's what finance, uh, open banking, open finance is at the end of the day. Hey, can, we, can I just ask that we start calling it open finance for the purposes of the rest of this conversation? I'm just <laughs> gonna go back to my original answer on this topic, which is like, we're already here. There's, it's not like open banking is gonna swoop down in some spaceship and like land in the US and like aliens are gonna pop out. Like, the ability for people to have complete and portable data in practice and like in the market is happening today. And it's not just about the bank data that's sitting in your DDA or your savings account. It's about your payroll data and your liabilities and all kinds of things um, that you should be able to permission because people don't just have one account that represents their uh, the way that they manage their financial life. They have many different types of accounts. So I, this one I care deeply about. So I will um, just ask that we call it open finance from now on. Great. So as a quick follow-up to that question, some related ones, uh, what do you think will actually happen for open finance in 2023? The regulation will be in place, that a date will be set for when banks must make their data publicly available via API? Oh my God, someone wants to dive into the Federal uh, Administrative Procedures Act rulemaking process. This is the best day of my life. Uh, so what I expect is that 
Uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau will collect comments from the public and companies on January 25th in response to their Small Business Regulatory Enforcement Fairness Act proposal for an open banking regulation. They will then publish a report on that in February, and sometime at the end of Q3 or beginning of Q4, they will publish a notice of proposed rulemaking or NPRM that lays out in detail what is likely to be the 1033 regulation in this country, at which point most big enterprise players will start adjusting on the assumption that that NPRM becomes the law at the end of 2024. Awesome. Cool. Uh, all right. So next up, uh, we have, I think this would be a good one for um, Ginger. Uh, what will happen to companies like Zelle or early warning systems after FedNow? Um, so actually, I might toss that one to Zach, who I think has a much stronger perspective on this topic than I do. Yeah, sure. Happy to happy to jump in. Um, so I look, I think I think at the end of the at the end of the day, having many ways for consumers to transact is an excellent thing. Um, and my hunch is that um, you know, as uh, Fed now or real time payments or anything better better versions of bank link payments um, uh, come to fruition, um, they will just be additive. Um, so I don't necessarily see those as a trade-off. Um, I think they'll be additive. I think that we'll see more and more adoption. And frankly, as consumers become much more used to using their bank account to transfer funds either to a friend to pay, pay them back for something maybe, um, or to, to, to purchase an item or something like that, um, then it, you know that, that will in aggregate, a kind of uh, rising tide rises all boats that will in aggregate um, kind of in, increase volumes across the board. So um, I expect that uh, you know, it'll be a quite harmonious um, uh, broadening of the market. Awesome. Uh, cool. So this one, I don't know, John, Zach, who wants to take this, but uh, do you all think that FedNow can scale quickly and can solve real-time and cross-border payments? So Zach, I don't think everyone in chat knows this, uh, and so I'm going to lightly dox you here, but uh, at the end of last year, you attended a roundtable with the Board of Governors at the Federal Reserve and actually provided a little bit of an answer to this question. So uh, with that lob in your direction, I'm going to suggest you take this one. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, I, I threw it for... Um... I have three or four hesitations on on the current structure for FedNow that I think can and and it might may well uh, be improved before it launches. Um, uh, first um, uh, and potentially biggest amongst them is um, there's just some some missing bits of infrastructure to make uh, FedNow work really really well. I think there are some very basic things that um, uh, FedNow could do to to accelerate the build of better fraud tools. Um, so that we can avoid with FedNow the kinds of issues that we saw with Zelle and others. So there's some very basic uh, little bits of information that they can make available to developers and users uh, to make that better. Second is just thinking about the user experience. The user experience right now in, in, in FedNow and in RTP is a relatively cumbersome one for the average user. Um, I you know put put some screen screen flows in front of uh, actually in front of my parents uh, who are a little bit older and they were very confused as to how to use it. You know, these are paper screen flows that you can show to people. Um, uh, and uh, you know I think there are some very basic ways to improve that uh, as well. Um, and then you know there's there's a couple of, like big questions that are still out there, such as how do you get all of the small banks to actually implement it um, when many of those banks actually don't have technical engineering teams uh, to, to to build that implementation. Um, so that's that's a big question in my mind. Obviously, there's a revenue incentive for banks to start adopting FedNow because they actually get paid uh, for the volume of payments that are going out. Um, however, uh, th there's a hill to climb between that. They have to actually build the integration in order in order to, to achieve those dollars. Um, and then the last one from my side, and this is a thing that's near and dear to my heart, but there is no dispute mechanism that's been built into FedNow. There's no dispute mechanism that's built in, been built into the ACH system. And this is the thing that I've always been frustrated with. Um, we have a wonderful dispute mechanism in the card world, but uh, there, there, there certainly are ways that we could port that over to the ACH system and, and, and to FedNow and, and real-time payments as well. Awesome. Cool. Uh, shifting to some ID verification related questions, which I'm going to selfishly take. <laughs> uh, all right. So we have one here that uh, says, what does a robust identity stack in 2023 look like Will it involve real-time bi biometric identity? And do you see AI and facial verification playing a role? Uh, so right now we're in the stage of the verification world where having a long tail of very niche specific anti-fraud 
methods uh, is actually very, very important. So you'll find that most people handle the biggest things, like they can do ID document verification, uh, they can do checks against credit bureaus, those kinds of things. Uh, and that blocks a decent amount of fraud, but it doesn't block the most aggressive forms of fraud, which can typically only be caught uh, with those long tail verification methods, things like behavioral biometrics, right? Looking at, you know, are they copy and pasting their social security number? Uh, you know, things like that to determine if it looks like they're uh, legitimate actors. So I think it's part of that biometric identity is an important component, uh, but it is not the be all and end all. Uh, it necessarily has to go alongside things like ID document verification, because it's the, it essentially allows you to authenticate that you are the person who actually provided that ID document. Um, but it's not, again, it's, uh, this might be a little bit too in the weeds, but basically like one of the big issues with ID verification is the users actually control the devices that they're submitting all of their information from. So you can't actually trust all of the data that's being submitted by those devices. That's just like a computer, that's a computer security thing. Uh, and so we need more robust ways beyond just the biometric authentication uh, to uh, verify those users. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, can I throw in one yeah. more question? Um, if this is such a big deal for fintech and, and for so many others, why why isn't the government stepping in and building something? Don't they have all the identities? Uh, it's a pretty common question that we get. I'd love to hear your take. Uh, so that's a that's a great one. Um, it's largely because of how uh, the United States is built, right? We're very private sector focused, and identity is no uh, exception to that rule. So the government has not typically wanted to jump in and say we're going to allow you to have access a centralized repository of identities. The closest thing we have is the ECBSV thing that the uh, Social Security Administration provides, which allows you to look up uh, SSNs, but that has a bunch of caveats to it as well. So I don't really see the government stepping in to help that. Uh, the closest step we're going to get is mobile driver's licenses, uh, which are verified with the state DMVs. Uh, that has not yet rolled out to all of the states, nor does it look like it's going to be rolling out to all of the states, particularly California and New York in the near term. Hopefully I'm wrong about that, but it doesn't look like it. Um, so unfortunately, private companies are going to have to solve the, the problem uh, for now because that's just a U.S. cultural thing. Cool. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and jump through to another question. Uh, Ginger, uh, is Plaid offering services like proactive financial wellness insights for the aggregated data? What are your views on this space? Yes, aggregated data. Um, so we are um, really trying to ensure that people, regardless of the kinds of accounts they use, can, can get the information from those accounts into the apps and tools that are giving them really great feedback and insights on how to better manage their money. So everything in the space around personal finance um, has been a real big focus for us and ensuring that um, a person can log into one of our customers' applications and get real-time information on where they stand with their budget, what are the kinds of liabilities that they need to be paying off, how can they better structure their debt plans, um, and how to just improve their overall lot in life through better financial management. Um, so yeah, this, this is a great space for us as we get into 2023. I think interestingly, um, as the pandemic sort of filtered down, meaning like people aren't rushing to digital tools and applications because of the pandemic only, and the macroeconomic trends have started to uh, worsen, we're still seeing you know 60 to 70% of US adults say that they're relying on FinTech and FinTech applications to give themselves strength and comfort and confidence um, in how they manage their personal finances, especially during this time. So super exciting space in 2023. Yeah, well, one of the things I'll say is uh, we get a lot of questions um, on this theme is like, you know, is, is Plaid going to build um, analytics on a per consumer basis so that a consumer can do this type of analysis or that they can they can qualify for that, that type of product? Um, Philosophically for us as a company, we view our job as to enable our customers to go do those kinds of things. So we wanna build the infrastructure and the tools that enable our many customers to go and create all of these, these unique insights in, in, in many different ways. Um, and one of our core focuses is to ensure that um, any user that wants to use that digital finance product can do that itself. So we focus on, on the breadth and the base layer of the infrastructure. Um, and then we, we really want our customers to, to go really deep in things like financial wellness insights or financial recommendations, things like that. And I've been just amazed at the quality of kind of personal financial management, personal money management tools um, that our customers have been able to build. Great. All right, one final question. Uh, to wrap us up for the day. So 
So this one for Zach Plaid, 2023. What's new? What's different? Oh man, this is a good one. Uh, well, well, all of us have grown at least two or three inches, so we're 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 ready to go for the year. No. Um, so this year, uh, four four major themes for us. Um, first theme is connectivity. Uh, so connecting into uh, every consumer's account that wants to connect it. Um, this means just you know a continued focus on integrating with every bank, improving each of those integrations, um, helping the banks build OAuth, launch OAuth, moving to OAuth as soon as they have it. Um, uh, really deep focus on uh, kind of quality, data quality, integration quality, onboarding quality, um, and then conversion. If a consumer wants to link their bank account, they should be able to link their bank account. That's our belief. Um, and so uh, our goal is to maximize conversion on the back of that. And um, you know, these are the things that we hear most frequently from our customers. This is our number one focus. This is where we're spending our time and this is what we're looking at. Um, second big area for us um, uh, is thinking about um, how and where can our data be used to fight fraud? Um, this comes in two flavors. Um, the first flavor is IDD, uh, ID verification, and all of the analytics that come out of that. Um, the second is uh, kind of user-oriented fraud tools. So we have a product called Signal um, that helps uh, it can, it helps a, a customer of ours understand if a given consumer uh, is likely to actually execute the transaction that they're trying to execute, or if it's going to fail for one reason or another, or if it might be a fraudster or things like that. So um, both from the identity side and from the much more analytical side, um, we're building uh, kind of a suite of tools to help help our customers really fight fraud fight fraud, I should say. Um, third is uh, kind of lending analytics and lending data. Um, despite the fact that uh, lending right now, the volumes are a lot lower going into the year, we're seeing this huge push towards digitization. And that's a thing that we can help with. That's a, whenever we hear uh, financial services wants to wants to digitize, that's, that, that, that is uh, near and dear to our heart and really exciting for us. And as we see this continued push towards lending digitization, we're building a lot of the tooling and infrastructure to help the lending market move in that direction as well. Um, lots more beyond that. So um, kind of continuing to, to, to think about international and international growth, um, continuing to think about um, uh, kind of how can we better enable companies that want to execute bank linked payments um, with, a, with a focus and, and a lot of attention to FedNow and RTP, as we've talked about a lot, um, and so much more. Um, but that said, we are now at our last minute. Um, so I want to just say uh, a couple of quick thank yous. Uh, first, thank you to all of you for coming to the Tech Talk. Um, we so appreciate having you here. We've loved the questions. We've loved the participation. Um, actually, I was just typing a note internally saying, look at all these questions. This would be super fun to do a follow-up Q&A. We can go a lot deeper on these. So um, you've, you've sparked some insights and some thoughts for us, which, um, which could be really fun. Um, a huge thank you to, to Ginger, to Alan, to, to, to John. Um, thank you for spending the time on this. Thank you for the, the, the candid um, the candid thoughts and, and, and being willing to, to answer some of my, uh, my off the wall questions here. Um, and to everyone that was on this, um, uh, we hope that we can continue the conversation with all of you soon. Um, if you're a Plaid customer um, and you wanna continue some of this conversation, please just ping your account manager or whoever you talk to day to day, we'd love to dive in with you. If you're not yet a Plaid customer, oh man, are we excited. Uh, we would love to work with you. Uh, so please do um, either ping our sales team uh, or ping whoever you're talking to uh, along the way. Um, and uh, please do be on the lookout for a recording that we're going to send out to you in the email tomorrow. So um, thank you all for this. Happy, uh, happy 2023. Uh, happy start to the year. And we're excited to chat with you all more soon. It's going to be a great year for FinTech.